Hello and welcome to my second GPU review video. I have managed to get my hands on an RTX 3080 a few weeks ago. It's nearly impossible to get one of these RTX 3080s, but I got very lucky. As many of you already know, I am still running an ancient 2008 Intel X58. The X58 only has PCI 2.0 and we will see how well the X58 performs with the latest and greatest from Nvidia. I am bringing the definitive X58 with an RTX 3080 review. Moving on to the specs, and I know this is going to really sound like a 2009 video, but bear with me. I am running the X5660 at 4.6 GHz with a Sabertooth X58, 24GB of DDR3 registered ECC RAM, SSD 3TB with 2.7GB read and 2.1GB write. EVGA Supernova G2 1300 watt power supply. In this RTX 3080 review, I am also using the EVGA RTX 3080 XC3 Black Gaming GPU. This GPU can boost up to around 1850 MHz. The EVGA RTX 3080 XC3 Black Gaming GPU was $729, but after price hikes, it became $799. Pretty much all of the RTX 3080 GPUs have increased in price. So basically we're going to see how well the X58 and the PCIe 2.0 performs with an RTX 3080 in several games. For the full list of games, be sure to head over to overclockthengame.com. So let's take a look and see how well the X58 performs with the RTX 3080. Once again, I would like to kick my benchmark off with Doom Eternal. The engine is well programmed and supports async compute very well. The graphics are still great and this game is all about killing demons with great music. As you can see, the X58 has no problems pumping out the frames. Even with limited PCIe 2.0 bandwidth and a nearly 13 year old platform, the X58 still performs great. At 1080p, it gave me an average of 302 frames per second, 1440p shows 255 frames per second, and 4K gave me 179 frames per second. 4K is the main focus for this review, but it is nice to show what the X58 is still capable of at 1080p with a well-coded title. As I'm sure most of you have expected by now, the lower resolutions run fine with no issues. Moving up to 4K, we continue to see that the RTX 3080 performs extremely well. 4K brings 95 frames per second on average. Although I did not run a real-time benchmark using the Ray Trace Shadow features, I did enable Ray Trace Shadow features for the built-in internal benchmarking tool that comes with the game. Unfortunately, I could not get DLSS to work properly. Hopefully, I can find a solution soon and update my charts on my website. Moving on to Cyberpunk 2077. This game definitely needs a lot of horsepower to run. The RTX 3080 should be well positioned to handle the requirements, but it seems that this game is just a bit much, even when ray tracing is disabled. 1440p is definitely the sweet spot for this game. 4K it is playable, but it's just not where it needs to be. To make this game playable at 4K, you will need DLSS enabled. In Resident Evil 2, the X58 platform with PCIe 2.0 delivered an average of 275 frames at 1440p and 114 frames per second at 4K. As you can see, I'm hitting a CPU bottleneck, but things get a bit better at 4K. That is still as good as it gets when it comes to RE2, and that's great news based on the numbers I'm seeing. More than 110 frames on average at 4K is awesome. Looking at the 1440p results in Metro Exodus, we can see going from traditional rendering to ray tracing with ultra settings leads to a 33% average frames per second drop. Even though those are large drops, they are still very playable at 1440p, as the results show. The RTX 3080 stays above 60 in the worst case scenarios and averages a nice 87 frames per second. 4K results with rasterization shows about 85 frames per second on average. Once we move to ray tracing, we see a sharp decline to 51 frames per second while using the ultra ray tracing preset. That comes out as a 40% reduction in average frames per second. So ray tracing really hits this game hard. The minimum frames per second drop is about 46%, which is the biggest problem that comes along with some micro stutter here and there. DLSS will be needed at 4K. Lowering the ray tracing preset to high does help push the 4K performance to 58 frames per second. That is a 13% increase when going from ray tracing ultra to high. 
I could not enable DLSS in this game. So therefore none of my results will have DLSS. I'm currently working on getting DLSS enabled. Hopefully these results will suffice. Be sure to check my article for updates once I can get DLSS enabled. So here are my results for Red Dead Redemption 2. At 1440p, I get around 100 frames per second on average. There isn't much to worry about, and if you need more frames per second, 1440p is always a great option. There are many graphical settings that can be optimized to get you more frames per second. The X58 platform does well at 4K and keeps the RTX 3080 somewhat busy. The RTX 3080 GPU usage averaged around 94% in this game. Control makes extensive use of ray tracing features, and I set all of those features to their max graphical settings. 1440p with ray tracing averages 51 frames per second, and with DLSS enabled, the performance increased by 37% to 70 frames per second on average. Sometimes you can see DLSS working and catch a little denoising at all resolutions, but it's nothing to worry about. If you must be above 60 frames per second with ray tracing, it appears that 1440p will be the resolution for you. Without DLSS, the GPU usage was at 98% with the X58, and with DLSS enabled, the GPU usage was at 90%. Be sure to check my article for the optimizations that I use to make this game run smoother at higher resolutions. Horizon Zero Dawn performs very well. The RTX 3080 pulls 89 frames per second at 1440p and 62 frames per second at 4K. This title makes the RTX 3080 sweat even without ray tracing. Taking a quick look at Quantum Break, while using the ultimate preset, we see that the game runs very well when the upscaling setting is enabled. No issues to report here other than the obvious CPU bottlenecking at lower resolutions. The issues arise when upscaling is disabled. During the 4K benchmark, we see a massive drop of 49%. The average frames per second dropped from 91 frames per second with upscaling enabled to 46 frames per second with upscaling disabled. This game is tough to run at native resolutions without upscaling. In The Witcher 3, since I'm running an NVIDIA GPU, I enabled all of the NVIDIA tech features. I averaged 86 frames per second with a low of 61 frames per second. Now moving on to the GPU temperature, I saw an average of about 71 Celsius. As far as power consumption goes, I found that the EVGA RTX 3080 XC3 Black Gaming pulls an average of 313 watts across all of my real-time benchmarks. Minimum was 304 watts and the maximum was 338 watts. Now let's take a look at the RTX 3080 and X58 power consumption. The first thing that caught my attention was the very low idle power consumption from both the X58 and the RTX 3080. Daily light usage outside of gaming pulls a very low amount of wattage, only 182 watts on average. We see that 3D Mark's Fire Strike pulls 593 watts on average and Superposition pulls 624 watts. That's a pretty decent amount to pull, but we need to see what happens with an actual game instead of synthetic benchmarks. I decided to use Resident Evil 2 so that we can see the RTX 3080 power consumptions in an actual game. We see that running the GPU core at stock with the power limit set to its normal stock setting, which is 100%, pulls 655 watts on average with my 4.6 GHz overclock. Locking the frames per second to 60 drops the wattage by 70 watts down to 585 watts on average. That's a pretty nice start. For more information on how to optimize your power consumption, please refer to overclockthingame.com and check out the RTX 3080 review. The EVGA RTX 3080 XC3 Black Gaming GPU core is overclocked out of the box by about 8%. However, the memory and other specifications are the same as the NVIDIA RTX 3080 Founders Edition. I was able to add a 5% increase to the memory and I increased the GPU core by 14% over the stock NVIDIA RTX 3080 Founders Edition as well. When comparing the EVGA RTX 3080 Black to the overclock results, we can see roughly a 5% increase in both the 4K and 8K benchmarks. In 3D Mark Fire Strike, we see very small increases and in some cases decreases at 1080p since I am very CPU limited but at higher resolutions, we see some decent increases across the tests. The 1440p breakdown shows an increase of 8.5% in the graphics test and the combined score, increased by 4%. The 4K result shows an increase of about 8.6% in the graphics test. Here we see an 8% increase. DirectX ray tracing shows a very small increase and Crytek's ray tracing benchmark shows a 4% increase at 4K. And here are my results in Doom Eternal and Shadow of the Tomb Raider.
So from what we have seen and what most people probably expected, the 2008 Intel X58 performs very well at higher resolutions such as 4K. I have compared the X58 and 6 core X5660 against modern machines running anywhere from 8 cores up to 16 cores. These comparisons consist of several sources for nearly all of the games and benchmarking apps listed below. When I combine the total performance numbers across the samples listed in the chart, we see an overall decrease of 0.05% when compared to newer platforms. You can read more in-depth information in the article as well. All right, so we have reached the end of my review, and I can honestly say that the RTX 3080 is a very nice GPU. I have to give NVIDIA a big compliment for supporting the older BIOS platforms. The RTX 3080 performs very well and depending on the title, 1440p is still the sweet spot. 4K is the main selling point. What I do not like is how you must sign into NVIDIA's GeForce Experience software in order to use it. AMD Radeon software does not require this. The other issue is that the GeForce Experience constantly tries to make a connection to the internet to phone home for some reason. I'm talking every other second by the way, and as a reference I captured 100 attempts to connect to the internet in a 2 minute span. This is very excessive in my opinion. Nvidia Reflex seems like a pretty interesting piece of software, but I do have concerns about proprietary software being built directly into games. If anything, it should be an open standard in my opinion. We could see both Nvidia and AMD start adding proprietary software to give different advantages in competitive games. With all of that being said, the RTX 3080 is a great GPU and goes to show how well NVIDIA has pushed their current architecture. NVIDIA is still attempting to perfect the ray tracing performance, but so far so good, since DLSS is there to help aid the experience. The RTX 3080 is worth the purchase for anyone that doesn't want to purchase the expensive RTX 3090 or the limited RTX 3070. Once the stock issues have been resolved, you will really enjoy this GPU. Be sure to check out my RTX 3080 review on OverclockThenGame.com for other information that was not discussed here. And thank you all for checking out my second video, my second YouTube video now. Once again, it was a little rough, but we made it. Next on the list, I'm not sure. I'm just going to do a lot of X58 with modern GPUs. You know, I might get a, a Radeon if I can get my hands on one of those. So stay tuned for that. Please be sure to hit that subscribe button. If you enjoy my content, please consider supporting me on Patreon or by donating on PayPal in the links below this video. Thank you.